tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The noise, it was like a freight train going through. Hundreds evacuated, one home destroyed as a wildfire rages in the South Okanagan also. We have the capacity currently uh, to meet demand. As COVID-19 cases rise, BC opens up more testing sites and... My concern about putting up this fence is it's similar to the Berlin Wall. Why have the Americans put up a fence along the Canada-US border in the valley? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us online tonight. We begin in the South Okanagan, where a major wildfire is raging near Penticton. One home has been destroyed, hundreds of others evacuated. As the CBC's Briar Stewart reports, as the fire grows, area residents are on edge. For more than 24 hours, crews have been trying to contain a fire after it ignited a tinder dry hillside perched above Skaha Lake in the Okanagan. There was a very strong northerly wind. It probably moved three or four kilometers in the space of an hour and a half. It was very, very aggressive and it's above where our winery is. Which is why John Skinner shut it down yesterday afternoon and was thankful crews protected it by dropping fire retardant nearby. Late yesterday, a few hundred were told to leave their homes and a few thousand were put on evacuation alert. When you live in the Okanagan, you get a sense that this could happen one day to almost anybody, especially in our area. It's, it's a very treed uh, and, and not a very uh, populated area. So we have things packed, ready to go. But as the fire roared through the night, some stayed behind. The noise, it was like a freight train going through it. This dramatic picture captured a homeowner looking for embers on his property as the fire burned behind. And there's embers all over the driveway, in the pool, on sidewalks, but um, just a sheer stroke of luck that they haven't ignited the grasslands around us. At least one home was destroyed as the wind pushed the fire closer to residential areas overnight. But today, a change in direction, which meant the fire started moving away from Okanagan Falls. However, the thick smoke remained a challenge for fire crews. So far, this fire season in BC has been relatively tame compared to years past, where dozens of fires led to huge swaths of the province under evacuation. But for the few hundred residents still out of their homes tonight, anxiety remains as long as the fire keeps burning out of control. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Brady Strachan is on the ground in Penticton tonight. And Brady, you've been following this story and you join us live now. You've been there since yesterday. What are you seeing where you are? Well, you can see behind us just how smoky the skies are here in Penticton. It, this is day two of this fire and the smoke is just really filling the sky. It's blocking out the sun as well. And that's something that everybody has been talking about here. We've been speaking with uh, people on vacation, but also, of course, with the evacuees who are going into, they'll be going into their second night out of their homes. They've been watching all the social media video that people have been putting up online, the news reports, and just seeing how that fire is burning above their homes. And that's very concerning. Um, here in Penticton, you can see the, the smoke rising much high above their homes. And uh, it's, it's really concerning for everybody here people that have been evacuated, but also people here on vacation. All right, Brady, we will leave you there. Thank you so much for that. Take care and stay safe out there. Thank you. And our meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff, is tracking that wildfire and others in the province tonight. She joins us now live. And Joe, are there any promising signs when it comes to fighting that fire near Penticton? Smoky skies, as we've seen. We're all, yeah. Oh, it looks like we may have just lost Johanna. Having some uh, technical challenges there. All right, we're going to go back to her in just a minute.
Well, BC is planning to more than double its current COVID-19 testing capacity, looking to test up to 20,000 people per day by the fall, as health officials confirm 68 new cases today. A new testing site is now open at Vancouver Community College's parking lot on East 7th Avenue between Keith Drive and Glen Drive. And more centres are coming to Surrey and the Fraser Northwest area as well. BC's total cases now sit at 4,745. There were no new deaths. Ten people, though, are in hospital, four in the ICU. 3,749 people have recovered. There are now 798 active cases in BC. More than 2,400 people are being actively monitored after exposure to known cases. We have the capacity currently uh, to meet demand. Now, there was an increase, an increase in short-term uh, increase in the amount of demand, and we are moving now quickly to respond to that increase. We're also going to be expanding testing and our testing capacity to meet um, the challenges of cold and flu season when we expect more people than, uh, uh, than uh, are happening in August to present with COVID-like symptoms. Currently, the province can test 8,000 people per day. And BC teachers are worried the province isn't doing enough to make sure classrooms are safe when school returns in three weeks. Our Tanya Fletcher joins us live in studio with more. So Tanya, these are new concerns that we're hearing about today. Which part of the back to school plan do teachers take issue with? Well, the teachers union says the plan has two particular holes in it. Not enough mask requirements and not enough room for physical distancing. I remember the education ministry updated its guidance two days ago saying masks will only be required in common areas that are often crowded like hallways and on school buses. The BC Teachers Federation wants face masks to be mandatory at all times, even inside the classroom. The learning groups are intended to be their own bubble. That bubble is 60 in elementary school and 120 in secondary schools. We think that's a very large bubble. We think there should be classroom density limits as well to facilitate uh, physical distancing. We think that's really important. The head of the BCTF there says they also want smaller class sizes to better allow for physical distancing. The learning groups are intended to be their own bubble. That bubble is 60 in elementary school and 120 in secondary schools. We think that's a very large bubble. We think there should be classroom density limits as well to facilitate uh, physical distancing. We think that's really important. And they're also asking for better accommodations for remote learning for immunocompromised students. All right, Tanya, so what uh, is the province uh, saying about what the teachers are calling for now? Well, regarding their urging for more mask use, uh, the education minister defended the province's current policy of requiring them only in certain situations. That's the scientific public health uh, advice that we've received. It's very consistent with the approach being taken by the vast majority of provinces and territories uh, in the country. Again, it's an area where we have uh, adjusted as we've gone. Uh, we've listened to our education partners, including teachers, about this. And, uh, and most importantly, we've listened to Dr. Bonnie Henry. And on class sizes, uh, he would only point out that these are smaller class sizes. In fact, the smallest the province has seen in generations, he says. And he didn't outrightly respond to their direct calls on that. He simply says these are fluid plans. They're constantly reviewing uh, the outlines and they will always listen to feedback from all groups involved. Leanne, Mike. Okay, thanks for that report tonight. Tanya Fletcher reporting live for us this evening. Now, on those questions about safety and back to school, we want to hear from you right now. How comfortable are you with sending your kids back or having to work in a school, perhaps? What do you think of calls for smaller classes during this pandemic? So if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube right now, easiest to just uh, leave a comment there. Or you can also email us, cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca, or give us a phone call. Yes, a phone call, 604-662-662. <laughs> Sixty-eight oh one. Now for some of that insight and to answer your questions, not just me and Mike sitting here, we have an expert on hand. Dr. Srinivas Murthy joins us. He's a pediatrician and an infectious disease specialist. And he's going to be with us for the next segment to answer your questions. So Dr. Murthy, first of all, thanks for uh, being here today. Always a pleasure. Yeah, so Dr. Murthy, my first question for you, I understand you're a parent yourself. You know, are you planning sending your kids back to school come fall? I am. Um, I'm planning on sending them back to their public school here in Vancouver. 
Um, obviously, much of it depends on how the overall public health infrastructure responds over these coming weeks with the increasing cases. Um, so we'll see how the next few weeks go. Okay, and uh, we're hearing, you're hearing a lot of questions about uh, kids and masks. Uh, are they effective? How strongly would you uh, advocate that, that kids wear them? There's been a lot of discussion about this, uh, particularly today, as uh, we get ready to go back to school. Yeah, no, obviously masks are a very hot topic right now. Um, and different provinces have different rules as to when masks should be worn by children and where and what age they should be worn. Um, and I don't think there's a definitive right answer as to when and where and which age children should wear them. I think the overall principle that masks do work at preventing infection from being transmitted um, is a principle that we can apply. Um, but a lot of it depends on how much infection is out there and whether the risk is worth the benefit. Not that I'm saying there's a large risk to wearing a mask. And right now, under our circumstances, do you think that uh, the benefit is there for to recommend having uh, kids, you know, 10 and up wear masks even in classrooms like the BCTF's calling for? So I think the, the, the highest risk exposure is in a closed environment across um, a poor ventilation with lots of people for a prolonged period. And in those contexts, you could consider that masks may have some benefit there um, if distancing cannot be um, obtained. All right, very good. Here's a question uh, from Rose on YouTube asking, uh, do you think if cases rise uh, when schools reopen that the schools might close down again? Look into your crystal ball there. <laughs> sure, that's a um, relatively impossible thing to say or answer to. Um, as I'm sure she knows, the cases have risen over the past week or so here in British Columbia. Um, and so we'll see what happens over the coming weeks. Um, we've seen in other jurisdictions that the opening of schools has not led to an overall uptick in the larger community. Um, but still, that experience is limited because, as you know, September is when most schools in North America will reopen. And so, uh, Dr. Murthy, another question from Rose. This is a good one, too. So um, what's your advice for how teachers and parents can deal with younger children teaching them about social distancing? Sure. And I, I think we've had over the past seven months um, a reasonable amount of experience in talking with our children about how distancing works, why we're distancing, um, and some lessons attached to that. And I think overall, most of our children have really a sort of acknowledged what we're going through right now and are responding in sort of a very resilient way. And I think supporting them along the way is, is crucial. Um, how we do that, and every child will be different. There are videos online. There are um, different games that we can play. Um, there's lots of resources available from the BCCDC for exactly that purpose. Okay, and we, we heard earlier the BCTF uh, calling for smaller class sizes uh, to better allow for that physical distancing. I, I mean, is, is there an appropriate number in your mind in terms of uh, number of students in, in a standard size classroom? Well, the Clearly, we don't know the exact number, whether it's 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, or 50. Um, we do know that less people is probably better than, than more people for contact tracing purposes and for the risk of acquiring an infection. Um, and so limiting numbers, the principle, um, is important. The exact number, I, I can't say. And getting in between sort of the policy nitty-gritty of it is not something <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do. <laughs> so, Dr. Murthy, I have a question as well. So, I mean, we're all trying to keep our bubbles small here. And I think what I've heard from a lot of parents is that, you know, I bring my kids back into school. All of a sudden, they're exposed to a whole bunch of other kids, dozens, perhaps even 120, if we're talking about these learning cohorts. You know, as we expose ourselves, is it okay to come back now to go, uh, go home to immunocompromised, perhaps, grandparents or, or relatives or even parents in that case? Is it safe to do that? Yeah, and that's a fundamental question that I think every family in bubble um, is going to have to make a risk calculation about. And mm -hmm. I think um, everyone's tolerance and willingness to tolerate risk is going to be different. And everyone's profile for severe disease is going to be different. And so it's difficult for me or anyone else to give an exact um, estimation of what that risk is. Um, but acknowledging that your bubble will increase with uh, your children going back to school um, and acknowledging that, that there's a small amount of risk attached to that. Great having you on the program again, Dr. Murthy. We really appreciate it. Have a good day.
Okay, I think we've sorted out our technical issues with uh, Johanna. Let's get back to uh, her now tracking uh, that wildfire near Penticton and others in our province tonight. And so, Joe, any promising signs when it comes to that fire near Penticton? What are you seeing? We are all waiting for that rain in the forecast. Uh, it's coming to Vancouver tonight, but it's not going to make its way to the hot spots in the interior until Friday. And as we heard earlier in the show from Brady, uh, winds, gusty winds have been a big part of the story. I want to show you what the game changer will be over the next 48 hours. Take a look at the satellite imagery. There is a big low pressure system sitting just off our coast. That's going to be pushing the moisture inland. But over the next 24 to 36 hours, we're still going to be dealing with warm temperatures and gusty winds until we can get that good rain. You can see all of the areas on the fire danger map in yellow and orange. Uh, those are the places where we're seeing the most active and out of control fires. Most of those areas will get some rain in the next uh, 48 hours, but it's not a guarantee for everyone. Just quickly running that through for you, you can see the rain doesn't quite spread all the way out to the southeast, but the southern Okanagan looking to get some good rain. Just want to take you back to some of those pictures from the uh, Christie Mountain fire. Wind gusts have been relatively low today, but as we head into the forecast tomorrow, looking for afternoon gusts up to 40 kilometers per hour, and that is without rain. So tomorrow will be crucial as the front rolls through on Friday. Will we also be looking for gusty winds up to 50 kilometers per hour, and then we'll get the rain. So again, a couple of uh, touch and go afternoons before we're rewarded with the, uh, the rain. All right, uh, the fire near Penticton, obviously uh, one of the big ones. Any other wildfires that you're keeping an eye on? Uh, there are over 30 uh, wildfires, active wildfires that are out of control, but I want to show you a time lapse from one just south of the border. This is the uh, Palmer fire. Uh, this one has blown up to 6,000 acres. You can see this time lapse from the National Weather Service in Spokane, just south of the border. Uh, thousands of people have been evacuated from their homes as well in Washington. Washington under a state of emergency and a Soyuz actually holding a meeting today to discuss the fire just south of the border because with those winds uh, pushing the fire towards the north, definitely watching how things play out closely in the southern Okanagan. And there's also a fire, uh, the Solomon Mountain Fire, just north of Beaverdale. That's very close to the Christie Mountain Fire. But these are two separate situations, both firing up around the same time. Uh, this one, though, has a quick grown to about 18 hectares and fire crews are also uh, working on this one about three helicopters on site so again a lot of hot spots uh, over the next 36 hours that won't see relief until friday uh, we'll keep you posted on uh, the whole situation okay joe thanks very much back to you in a bit with more on the uh, local forecast and when we're going to see that rain arrive here in uh, metro vancouver talk to you again in a bit Well, a new addition along the longest undefended border in the world to tell you about tonight. A cable fence has been put up on a stretch of the Canada-U.S. border near Aldergrove and Abbotsford. Tina Lovegreen now on who built it and why. I just said they all want to After a while, catching up on the phone just doesn't do the trick. We've just missed each other so much and we just, um, just want to be a little closer. Evelyn lives in Washington State and her sister is here in B.C. So they decided to meet up at the border like so many others have throughout the pandemic. But they were surprised to see this new fence. I asked if it was electric, <laughs> so it's not. This stretch of the border along Zero Avenue in Abbotsford has always been separated by just a ditch, no walls or barriers. But this week, the Americans began putting up this fence on their side. And today, more drilling. I call it the Trump wall. Maybe it's because of the uh, COVID-19 people meet during the day, uh, mostly on the weekend. And they, uh, they sit on each side of their country and they, they stay there for hours. When we asked the Border Patrol agent why... It helps reduce the illegal crossing of people and products. In a statement, the U.S. Border Patrol said the cable barrier is to protect both countries to secure the border by deterring illegal cars from entering either side, saying transnational criminal organizations have capitalized on this vulnerable area by smuggling both narcotics and people. Just last month, police caught two men running the border, and the RCMP seized over 200 kilograms of meth, likely one of the largest in Canadian history. 
I don't know who the Americans are trying to keep out because the vast majority of Canadians have no interest in traveling to this country. My concern about putting up this fence is it's similar to the Berlin Wall. When the Berlin Wall first went up, it wasn't a big, a big wall. It was a small fence. And it's a slippery slope. Where does it stop? Are they now going to put up more of a permanent wall? Oh, it is kind of nice to feel like we're in the same proximity. I feel like a border or having a fence between the border would kind of make it less personal. While yeah, families and friends like continue to be separated by the border shutdowns, having a physical barrier just makes it feel more real. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Abbotsford. Today marks five years since the body of a 19-year-old woman was discovered off the coast of Vancouver Island, and police are still asking for your help to solve that crime. Dolores Dee Dee Brown was last seen in the early hours of July 27th in 2015, partying on Penelicate Island with friends. Her body was discovered near Norway Island three weeks later. Police suspected criminality in her death, and they're still trying to figure out who was responsible for that homicide. Her aunt, who raised her, says she still thinks about her every day. Yeah, we don't want her to be forgotten. We want to find out who did this to her. She wouldn't hurt a fly. Police believe a member of the public may hold a key piece of information that could solve the case. RCMP are asking anyone with information to contact them or Crime Stoppers. The Conservatives are accusing Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of a cover-up tonight. They say he prorogued Parliament yesterday to avoid scrutiny of the WE Charity contract. The CBC's David Cochran has a story and a warning. It does contain some strong language. Parliament may be closed and committees shut down, but the show must go on. Next page. Blacked out. This page. Blacked out. This page. Blacked out. This page. Blacked out. The Conservatives handpicked the heavily redacted pages from the thousands released by the government. But also unredacted ones they say proves a cozy relationship between the Liberals and the WE Charity. An April email from Mark Kielberger to the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, saying, thank you for all that you and the Prime Minister do. A different email from a different Kielberger, from Craig to then-Finance Minister Bill Morneau, saying, it was incredibly thoughtful of you to call. An email between civil servants from a senior official working for Morneau. We is connecting with my minister. They are besties. That same official also wrote this. She, to start off with, says the Canada Student Service Grant is, quote, a bit of a shit show. That seems like an understatement at this point. The student grants program is dead in the water with the WE charity fighting to survive. Bill Morneau has resigned and Parliament is prorogued until September, disrupting the committees investigating the WE controversy. We have released all those documents to uh, the members of the committees so that they can uh, spend their time going through those uh, mountains of documents over the coming weeks so that they can continue to ask any questions they like on this issue. Also in those documents are numerous emails and memos that support the government's central defense. Civil servants across multiple departments insisting the public service could not deliver the grants program and that we was the best and only option to make it happen. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Kamala Harris is poised to make history tonight as the first woman of color to accept a spot on a major party's U.S. presidential ticket. But before she accepts her party's nomination for vice president, Susan Ormiston takes a look at what to expect from the first woman of color in that position. Back then, when we could hug, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden looked like they might team up. She'd lost a presidential bid, but was still in the game. Because Biden needs Harris to try to draw in women and engage black and biracial voters. It's the difference between black voters just showing up and black voters showing out and going the extra mile and bringing other people with them on their journey to the polls. She fights for women's rights. That's part of her challenge, and tonight she'll tell Americans why they should trust her. When I saw her walk out with him, I, I teared up. I, I cried. Hmm. Um, it is a moment in history that I don't know that I expected to see. 
But Harris's political life was entirely forged in liberal California as attorney general and then a U.S. senator for four years. Much of the country barely knows her, especially in the Midwest where Democrats need to swing states. What do you think of the VP choice? I really don't know much about her, to be perfectly honest, and I haven't had time to, like, check into her background, so I don't have an opinion on her at all. For those more familiar, like Bob Craig, who's voted Democrat and Republican, Harris is experienced and not too far left. I think she'd be really good, and I think she's, she, she'd be excellent, I think, as far as pulling people together also. President Trump has already gone after her as mean, nasty, and now bossy. Sleepy Joe Biden and his boss, Kamala Harris, Kamala. His signposting of a new political target will land well in Trump country once his fans catch up. I'm not a fan of Biden. And Kamala Harris? Don't really know a whole lot about him, so I'm not a fan. Expect Harris tonight to counterattack as a skilled former prosecutor, and Biden needs that too. CBC's Susan Ormiston reporting tonight from Delaware. Well, weeks of extreme weather have created more dire fire conditions in Northern California. This driver made a harrowing escape through the flames of one wildfire in Napa Valley overnight. Another fire about an hour away forced police to go door to door in the middle of the night urging people to get out. Weekend lightning strikes triggered about 40 wildfires that are tearing through the San Francisco Bay Area. The flames are being fueled by extreme heat and high winds. Thousands of people are under evacuation orders. A state of emergency has been declared. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is back. So, Joe, you are on Wildfire Watch, not just here, also in California. What are you seeing over there? Uh, yeah, as Mike mentioned, those lightning strikes, really a huge part of this story in California. Unlike British Columbia, where most of our fires are started by lightning, in California, uh, most of them are started uh, by human causes. And then we get those Santa Ana winds fanning them. 11 thousand lightning strikes have been recorded across California over the past 72 hours and that's led to almost 400 new fire starts so certainly an anomaly for that state although an increase in lightning strikes is something that uh, new climate research is making a link between so uh, not only is that starting new fires but again as Mike mentioned uh, that air quality the smoke the Bay Area seen the poorest air quality uh, out of anywhere in the world today. So uh, watching the situation right along the west coast of uh, North America over the next couple of days. Uh, let's take us back to our forecast. Uh, we've got those uh, warm temperatures coming down as we also wait for the rain. Take a look at the afternoon temperatures across the southern parts of the province. Yesterday, places like Penticton hit the high 30s. Now coming down to the high 20s. These, these are your current temperatures. Still hanging on to a 31 in Cranbrook, Vancouver. It's been a cooler day, but it was quite muggy uh, to start things off. This is our game changer, as I mentioned earlier. This low pressure system will be spreading rain into Vancouver overnight tonight. I think most of the heavy rain will hang off until after, or the rain in general will hang off until after midnight. But you can see as I take you through to Friday evening, there are some heavy pockets. The uh, whites there indicating over 100 millimeters for parts of uh, the island to Fino and then up towards the Sunshine Coast. Uh, that rain will spread into the southern Okanagan about uh, 10 to 40 millimeters if we're lucky. Doesn't quite make it into the southeast, but at least we're seeing that cool down. Vancouver 23 for tomorrow. These are just straight uh, model produced forecast highs. I think that's being a bit generous. I think we're going to struggle even into the high teens with our long range forecast. Check this this out Thursday and Friday uh, rain showers tomorrow I'll say ramping up to some rounds of heavier rain for Friday Metro Vancouver we could see 20 to 40 millimeters over the next couple of days and look at that overnight cool down Saturday night is going to feel good 13 degrees <laughs> is your overnight low we get the sunshine back for Saturday and Sunday but uh, yes we await the rain this time tomorrow I will have an umbrella nice setup to the weekend though love it thanks Joe Well, in the championship round of our summer-long search for the best neighborhood in Metro Vancouver, 
Mount Pleasant will be one of the finalists. The Vancouver community defeated Fort Langley in the semifinals to get to the last round, but who will it face off against? One of the two contenders is the small municipality of Pitt Meadows, and Justin McElroy reports on how the town has rallied around this competition. We're a long way from downtown Vancouver. Pitt Meadows is just like a quiet, small farming community. When people think about Metro Vancouver neighborhoods, they're usually smaller, denser. So what does Pitt Meadows do here? A neighborhood is about community, closeness, family, friends, you know, the yard, the barbecue, the dog, all that. So, like, you know, that's Pitt Meadows, right? Pitt Meadows was one of six municipalities under 20,000 people included in this 192 neighborhood competition and has gotten to the final four on the strength of a community that has embraced the competition and wants people to know why it's so special. People move here for the same reason, though. They love the ambience of the city, they love the feeling, and they want it to stay the same. Gwen O'Connell has been a counselor most of the time here since 1994. Pet Meadows has nearly doubled in size in that time, but with so much room, they've been able to maintain much the same feel. You can't expect to go you know, up to 20,000 people. You can't expect it not to change. But what hasn't changed is that feeling of a community. And it's the old, you know, old fashioned, home look and people like that. It will be in tough against Teveston in the semifinals, but Pitt Meadows has plenty of pride and even some good natured campaigning on its side. Steveston is a beautiful place. Everybody loves to go for fish and chips and, and, and such, but and it's very touristy. Mm -hmm. But Pitt Meadows is just very homey. A homey place that has a lot of land and a lot of fans. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Pitt Meadows. Pitt Meadows is lovely. You know who it defeated before it oh, got to this spot. Oh, I might spot. remember that. Yeah. Deep Cove, my beloved Deep Cove. Your beloved Deep Cove. But did that convince you? Did Justin convince you there? <laughs> well, one tries to be objective uh, and impartial in these situations, Leanne. Uh, but go Steveston. <laughs> go Steveston. Oh, my goodness. You know what? Go, <laughs> go Mount Pleasant. We are in the finals. Yeah. That's my hood. Homer. Uh, Pretty excited about that, and she's talking about how like everything old kind of feels new yeah, again. Yeah, that's true. You have that in my community too, there so you. it's going to be a tough competition to the end. All down to the finals. That's right. Mm. All right, this next story. If you are a fan of ridiculous monster movies like Sharknado, this next one's for you. Love Sharknado. After uh, COVID restrictions were eased in Alberta, filming began on a new movie about a creature that's part shark and part dinosaur. But this B movie is getting an A for social distancing. Here's more from the set and drum heller. We're on the Seal Ranch. It's the old Lonesome Dove set. Shooting what's called the Ballad of Sharkosaurus, set in the Ballads of Drum Heller. So a shark dinosaur is attacking an old western town, and Betsy Tyrell the town owner and coal mine owner. She's the one who's trying to protect the town. Old Virgil staying old Virgil. This is an ambitious three-day shoot we're doing in two days. Like right now on set, I've got a stunt performer doing wire work. I've got air cannons. I've got a 17-foot long animatronic dino shark and a bunch of blanks and guns being fired. A film that is just so involved in practical effects. What you see is what you get. You're gonna have the stained hands here for for a little while, which is always a good thing. That's when you know you've, you've done it right. So we sound and then rumble. My hopes for Sharkosaurus are, are so big. I think Sharkosaurus truly is the hero we didn't know we needed right now. I feel like we want to take this as far as, as he can go. Sharkosaurus! I can't even. Producer Matthew says see. it's the stupidest thing he's ever seen. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's the hero we never knew we needed, Sharkosaurus. Okay, you don't well, put yeah. him down. Look, if it's if it ends up being anything like uh, Sharknado, which uh, it Huge did hit. extremely well, yeah, the sequel as well. Yeah, I, th I, I predict Sharkosaurus may do very, very well. I can't even predict what this plot is going to be. There was a giant shark head on the legs of a T-Rex. I'm going to give it all away, so that's good. That's good. You'll have to, you have to wait for it. Go oh, for it. my goodness. That was too funny. There you go. Okay, uh, that's it for us uh, online tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, our broadcast will again be online uh, oh. only tomorrow night, our 6 o'clock broadcast because of hockey. But uh, Dan Burrett will be on television with the newscast 
at 11 o'clock tonight. Can't Africa miss him. Basketball. He's as good as Shark Sharkosaurus. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.